Welcome back to a continuation of chapter six. So we started off the beginning of chapter six talking about frictional force, and we're gonna finish up with talking about two additional forces. First, we're gonna discuss the drag force, also known as air resistance when things are moving through air, but you can have drag in water and other places. Um, we'll focus mostly on air resistance and terminal speed. And the second thing that we're gonna discuss is uniform circular motion, which gives rise to, or really, I should say better, uh, is a result of centripetal force, some outside force supplying centripetal motion, enabling something to continue in a circular path. So those are the things we're going to discuss now. So starting with drag force. So in order to explain where drag comes from, and don't, don't, don't worry, this is quite exciting. It's not a drag, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> okay, anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, so in order to understand where drag force comes from or where uh, what gives rise to drag force, we need to think a little bit about pressure. Now we're going to dive into pressure in more detail later, but we're needing to introduce it at this point. And really all pressure is is a force exerted over some area. All right, so here's a baseball. Let's say it's moving at a low speed. If you're throwing it through the air, you'd be throwing it in this case to the left. It would be moving at a low speed and if it's at a low speed, then you're going to have even pressure in front and behind your ball and even pressure on the two sides. Why pressure is higher in front and lower on the sides? Well, stay tuned in chapter 14 and you'll find out. But when this object is moving relatively slowly, this is the type of flow that you would approximately see around the ball. As a result, you'd end up with an even pressure on each of the two sides of your ball and even pressure in front and behind your ball. And so the only thing that's gonna be slowing the ball down at all is what's known as skin friction or friction with the air at the edge. That's a form of drag force, it's part of drag force, typically for things like baseballs, golf balls, things at day-to-day -day speed, it's probably a little bit on the weaker side, but it is part of the drag force. So this is what we're gonna call viscous drag, also known as skin friction is what you get with air moving over a surface just like you get friction between your hands when you rub them together or sliding a box across the floor experiences friction. This is friction with the air. So that's viscous drag and it's going to always be pointing directly backwards against the direction of motion. All right, so viscous drag. But a lot of times when you have something moving at slightly higher speeds, you're going to get an onset of turbulence occurring behind your object. When you get uh, turbulence occurring behind your object, you no longer have this nice even pressure in front and behind the ball. Instead, when turbulence begins to occur, you get this sort of turbulent wake behind your object. And that turbulent wake typically has a lower pressure than there is in front of the ball. As you'll see in chapter 14, Things will always accelerate from high pressure to low pressure. Again, pressure is force over area. So if there's more pressure here, there's likely to be more force. And if there's less pressure here, there's likely to be less force. So that pressure difference gives rise to a backwards pointing force. And that backwards pointing force is what we would refer to as pressure drag. All right, so you can have an object with lower pressure behind as a result of turbulence having pressure drag pushing backwards. And since it's still moving through the air, you still have viscous drag. And so in this case, you would have both pressure and viscous drag together slowing the ball down. So when we talk about air resistance in this class, for now, we're gonna be referring to both pressure and viscous drag together in most situations. Um, we're just gonna talk about air resistance to kind of encompass both of those. You'll dive into it in more detail if you take a fluids class later on and you'll really be able to learn a lot more of this at, at a greater depth at that point. But for now, I just wanted to introduce the idea of pressure and viscous drag, which we're gonna lump together and call air resistance. So how are we going to quantify this overall drag force, this overall air resistance? All right, so uh, because our book is funny, it uses a picture of a falling cat to represent or to talk about drag force. So if you have the cat, and he's not moving at all, the only force acting on him is gravity. But as he gets going faster and faster, there's gonna be more and more air resistance acting against him, more and more drag force opposing the direction of motion. And so therefore, 
there would be an increasing air resistance. So the air resistance, and you can ask anybody who's ever gone skydiving or anything like that, or even if you've ever stuck your hand out of a car as you're moving, you know that air resistance seems to increase. It gets a stronger resistive force as uh, speed increases. So if we want to come up with an equation to try to quantify this drag force, we're going to know it has to have something to do with speed. All right, so the equation that you can get uh, and derive even for the drag force is that D, the drag force, is equal to one half, and so let's label these different variables, okay? One half C, which C is a drag coefficient, kind of like a coefficient of friction, um, which is usually experimentally determined based on the, uh, si or the shape of the object and really the, the surface material as well, okay? Um, C, we're going to call a drag constant or coefficient that's constant, but in reality, it's not very constant. It really varies um, depending on speed and other things as well. But we're going to approximate it as a constant for now. This Greek letter rho here looks like a little p. That's a density. That's the density of the air or really any fluid that your object's moving through. But that's the density of the fluid. A here is not the overall area, but just the cross-sectional area of your object. So if we have this tennis ball and we're looking at the drag force it's experiencing, it would be the cross-sectional area of the center. So the area of the circle defined by the center of the tennis ball. All right. And then V here is the speed of the object. Um, well, the, really the relative velocity or relative speed of the object relative to the air. Why do I say relative and not just say the speed? Well, if I throw the ball at five meters per second, then and the I'm in my room here, so the air is not moving or anything, then I would say that that speed is, yeah, just five meters per second, the speed of my ball. But if I threw it at five meters per second, and there is wind blowing this way at 10 meters per second, that speed relative to one another would actually be 15 meters per second, and you'd get much more drag, even though the ball is moving at the same speed, the increased air speed would increase the drag as well. All right, so that's the drag force, and you're going to use that to calculate a few different things as time goes on. Again, C is an experimentally determined value, so that's something you're likely to be given or need to calculate from an example problem, and then air density, uh, cross-sectional area, and the relative velocity of your object. All right, so something that you'll hear about or you've probably heard about is terminal velocity or I mean, a more accurate way to talk about it is terminal speed. If somebody jumps out of an airplane to go skydiving, at a certain point, they're going to reach a maximum speed. All right, they're not going to be accelerating downward anymore. So if they've reached that maximum speed where they're not accelerating downward any longer, what does that mean? What must have happened? Well, if we think about a free body diagram, like here we see a statue of somebody skydiving, you know that their weight force is going down, and just like we saw with the cat, the drag force is going up, right? So if we set up some of the forces for somebody that's freely falling or an object that's freely falling, we'd have the drag force in the upward direction, we'd have the weight of the person or object in the downward direction, and that equals MA. And in you're going to have a situation where A is likely going to be negative. You're going to be accelerating in the downward direction. But eventually what happens, since drag is dependent on velocity, as you get going faster and faster and faster, your drag gets larger and larger and larger. Eventually you get to a situation where your drag force is equal to your weight. If your drag force equals your weight, you are no longer accelerating. So this becomes equal to zero. So to solve for what that speed is at which you will no longer accelerate, known as the terminal speed, you would just plug in your equation for drag here. Know that this is just your weight, mg, and you're looking for the situation where your acceleration is zero. If you do that and solve for velocity, you would find this as the equation for the terminal speed. This is the speed at which a freely falling object would no longer be accelerating downward. Fg, again, is the weight of the object, so you could even just substitute in mass times gravity, and the rest of these terms all come from our drag equation. If you have any questions on that, let me know. I'd be happy to clarify it in more detail for you, but I bet you could do that little derivation quite easily. All right, so again, this is the terminal speed of an object. 
all right? And so how can you alter your terminal speed? All right, well, one way to alter your terminal speed is to uh, alter your weight, obviously, but a lot of times you can't do that. So the other way that you'll see skydivers alter their terminal speed is by changing their cross-sectional area. If they decrease their cross-sectional area, they can have a larger terminal speed. And so you'll see if their body's aligned, you know, more vertically, you have a much smaller cross-sectional area, right? And so therefore you're able to go faster. Whereas if you're in like a more spread eagles position, similar to this picture here, you're gonna have a larger cross-sectional area and therefore a lesser overall terminal velocity. And you can even see this, I should even just do kind of for fun, right? Here's a piece of paper. If I orient it in this manner and I drop it, look, whoa, it doesn't go super fast. It reaches terminal velocity very quickly. Whereas if I orient it in the other direction where it has a much smaller cross-sectional area, the rate at which it's able to accelerate downward is very high because it gets, has less drag force and therefore it has a larger possible terminal velocity. All right, so cool. Let's do a quick example problem on this before we move on. So let's say that you go skydiving, all right? You decide to go skydiving and you do a little experiment on the way down because, you know, physics rules and you can't help but do experiments as you go. So you decide to start off in a spread eagle position, increasing your cross-sectional area as much as possible. And you have uh, some little device that tells you how fast you're moving in free fall. And you see that, hey, look, in the spread eagle position, I'm able to reach a maximum possible speed, a terminal speed of 184 kilometers per hour. <clears throat> You then decide, all right, let's pick things up a little bit. And you decide to nosedive, all right? So you point your head straight down, you nosedive, decreasing your cross-sectional area the best you can. And you observe that you're able to reach a speed of 312 kilometers per hour. Boy, howdy, almost double, right? Um, so my question to you, just based on that, if we make the assumption that your coefficient of drag is approximately the same in both orientations, all right? And the density of the air is approximately the same as well then I want you to tell me what is the ratio of the cross-sectional area when you're in the spread eagle form versus what is the cross-sectional area in the nosedive position. So you can't find either of those without more information, but I just want the ratio, all right? And when I say ratio, what I'm asking you for is what is one over the other. So it asks you for the ratio um, of the slower position to that of the faster. So I want the area in the slower divided by the area in the faster. So the slower position should be a larger area, so you should have a number greater than one, but how much greater? How much were you able to change your cross-sectional area? Give this one a go, ready, go. Pause the video, try it out. Sweet, all right, so here's that same problem. Now let's go ahead and jump in and try to solve it. Hopefully you got an answer, hopefully it's a box-worthy answer and it's the correct answer, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you, um, yeah, the process here. As I mentioned earlier, we want to figure out this ratio, the cross-sectional area in the spread eagle position divided by the cross-sectional area in the nosedive position. And as we just learned, drag force is equal to one half the coefficient, the drag coefficient multiplied by the air density, multiplied by the cross-sectional area, and multiplied by the velocity squared. So for position one, we would use all the one subscripts, position two, all the two subscripts, and again, just so you don't get confused, one is the spread eagle position, two is the nosedive position. Now, one thing we know for sure to be true, right? In both situations, we're at terminal speed. The speeds are different, but in both cases, our drag force must be equal to our weight if we're at terminal speed. That's the definition of terminal speed. We're no longer able to accelerate because our drag force has become equal to our downward pointing weight force. So what this means then, if we wanna solve for this ratio, even though we don't have very much information at all, we do know that our two drag forces must be equal to one another. So we can go over, go ahead and set these two equations equal to one another. So our drag force in position one is equal to our drag force in position two. All right, boy howdy, cause look at this, look, boom, one half cancels out, boom, C cancel out, boom, density cancel out and we have a much reduced and simpler equation. We wanna solve for A1 divided by A2, so I'm gonna divide both sides by A2 and divide both sides by V1 squared, and I'll get the relationship of the area ratio is just equal to the velocity 
ratio squared, all right? But notice A1 is on top and A2 is on bottom. V2 squared is on top and V1 squared is on bottom. Plugging in our values, we have 312 kilometers per hour squared divided by 184 kilometers per hour squared. Some of you might be like, wait a second, hold on, you're using kilometers per hour? That's not SI units, what's the problem with that? You know, good observation if you were thinking that, but what you would find, because our units are gonna cancel out, because we have kilometers per hour on top and on bottom, it doesn't actually matter. You could go ahead and convert to meters per second, and if you did that, no problem, good job you'd still get the same answer. And so what we find is that area ratio should be a box worthy 2.88. Again, no units because it's just a ratio. But what this means is when you moved from the spread eagle position to the nosedive position, you reduced your cross-sectional area to almost one third of what it started with. Yeah, pretty cool. So good job. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop here, take a break. And then we're going to continue and talk about uniform circular motion in the next video. So, hope you enjoyed. And as I promised, this was no drag at all, was it? Huh.